Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. When you enter the sanctuary this morning, you are handed an order of worship. This order of worship will aid you in the worship of Almighty God. The, the hymns we sing, uh, the, the confessions we say, the prayers we say together are all in your order of worship. If you did not get an order of worship, you can raise your hand and an usher will gladly bring you a copy of this order of worship. There are two announcements that I want to draw your attention to. One is this. Uh, draw your attention to all the announcements are important, either for you to show up or for you to pray for. But the one announcement that I want to highlight for you is this Saturday, uh, you'll notice that I, there's a youth event that is taking place here. It's Cross Youth Fellowship with uh, Christ Presbyterian Church in Noonan. And our church will be hosted here. If you are a youth, I would encourage you to come, for you to participate, for you to fellowship. If you're visiting with us, you're welcome to come as well. Parents, if you have questions about this youth event, you can talk with Marcus Dorsey following the worship service, and he'll kindly and gladly answer any of your questions. Also, for the rest of us, if you don't have youth, you can still participate by praying. So put it on your calendar, put it wherever you ordinarily have your prayer list, and make sure that on Saturday you pray for Marcus and you pray for our youth as they gather together. The second announcement is this. This is the month of March, as hopefully that's not news to you. Palm Sunday and Easter is in a couple of weeks. I read an article this past week that said the reason why people don't invite their family and friends to worship on Easter is because they don't know how to. Now, I'm not saying that is true about you. Uh, maybe, maybe not be. I don't know. But here I want to encourage you. How can you invite someone to worship with you on Palm Sunday and Easter, well, the session has made it easy for you. One, you can just hand them this order of worship. As you'll notice on the back of your order of worship, it says you are invited. You don't only have to talk to someone if you don't want to. Just hand it to them and walk away. That's one way. Probably be helpful if you at least greet them before you hand it to them. But you can hand it to them, invite them to worship with you. Another is there are cards that are not connected to the order of worship, but just little index type cards. Again, gives you a tool. As you're talking, as you're engaging about life, as you're saying, how are you doing? How are things going? Hey, do you go to church? And if they say no, then say, well, I would invite you to my church and hand them a card. It's as simple as that. You don't have to have a formula. You don't have to have all the right answers. And that's as easy as it, as it gets to invite someone to come to worship with you. I don't know where you are in your spiritual journey. I don't know the things that can and will prevent you from worshiping the true and living God? This I know. He's worthy of our attention. He's worthy of our worship. Let me ask that you stand. As you stand, we are proclaiming to each other and to the watching world that Christ is risen. He is risen. We're to worship from Psalm 24. Listen to these words, church. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers who shall ascend the hill of the Lord who shall stand in the holy place he who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully he will receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation such is the generation of those who seek him who seek the face of God of Jacob lift up your heads O gates and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Let's pray. God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, you have called your people together on this day to worship you. We are not here by accident or happen circumstance. We are here because you have called us to gather in the name of Jesus to worship. Lord Jesus, we know that you are the king of glory. You deserve and demand and command our attention and our worship. So we pray that all the different elements of this worship service, the prayers we say, the hymns we sing, the giving of our tithes and offerings, the preached word, may it all direct our attention to the almighty throne of almighty God. 
maybe by the power of the Holy Spirit, be able to end all worldly distractions, both the good and the bad. And that for the next few moments, as we've gathered in your name with your people, may we fix our eyes on you, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For we pray this in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray by saying, in the worship of our Lord, we also have the wonderful opportunity in which we can confess together. We can make a proclamation on what we believe. And so as I ask, will you follow along? Will you read at the Apostles' Creed? Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
turn in your order of worship to page two, we have a responsive reading. It comes from the Westminster Larger Catechism. If you all have been following along, we have been going through this year, and we've moved into the area in which we learn about our sin. We learn about the ways in which the misery that we're in. And while it might seem a little bit of a downer this morning for us to, to remind ourselves of this, this is a gift to us because we're reminded of the grace that the Lord has shown us, the ways in which he has saved us from this misery. And so, as I ask the question, will you answer together? How is original sin conveyed from our parents unto their prosperity? Original sin is conveyed from our first parents unto their prosperity. By natural generation, so that all, all proceed from them. Are conceived and born in sin. What misery did the fall bring upon mankind? The fall brought upon mankind the loss of communion with God, its new treasure and the curse. Born slaves of Satan, and justly liable to all punishments in this world, and that is to come. You may be seated. If you'll join with me in prayer as we go to our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift it is, as we have just read about the sins in which we have been born into, the sins in which we have been uh, all the way and completely saturated with. And Lord, as we think of, of this terrible estate that we have been born into, and the ways in which we, as we have grown and as we have seen sins go forth in our lives in terrible ways, Lord, the ways in which you have revealed to us, yet even this morning, the grace that is found in the gospel, the ways in which we see, even from the beginning, even from the fall, in which you provided a way through your Son. Lord, we're thankful for that gift, and we're thankful that you are not a God that is far away, but that you are near to us. You are near to your people. You have not just saved us and left us to dwell by ourselves, but that you are our Father, and we are your children, and that we can come to you, and that we may offer up prayers, and you hear them. And not only do you hear them, but you answer them according to your will, and you remind us of your goodness as you have shown us over and over again how much you care for us. So this morning, as we have entered into worship, as we've heard of how good you are, Lord, we, we offer up requests that you would be with this world. Lord, we think of the, the many ways in which this broken and fallen world has, has hurt people. We think of those that are overseas and in countries in which they're not able to freely share the gospel. They're not able to, to meet and gather like we are this morning. And so, Lord, we pray that you would be with our brothers and sisters as they are persecuted. We pray that you would protect them, that you would continue to encourage them, that you would allow them to see the fruits of their labors. Lord, we're thankful for the ways in which you have equipped us as a church to be able to send missionaries to, to help and assist in the growth of your church. We pray that you would be with those missionaries and others that are continuing to do the hard work in foreign countries. Lord, we pray that you would be with us here in the United States. Lord, we are thankful for the ways in which you have blessed us with a country that we are able to gather freely. Lord, we also are thankful that you've given us the ability to vote and to be able to, to make change and to, to be able to pursue uh, the ways in which you have called us to be uh, in this world and separate from it at the same time. So Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom as we see the future and oftentimes uh, or look to the future and as we see the, the challenges that face this nation. We pray that you would you would guide us, that you would direct us, that you would not allow us to become anxious, that you would not allow us to, to doubt your goodness in it. But Lord, we do pray that you would bring a great awakening to the United States, that you would bring great revival, that there would be a turning back to you. Lord, we pray that not just for the nation in general, but for uh, the, the immediate community around us, Lord. And as it expands out, Lord, we think of the many ways in which the church uh, is is it recognized more uh, during uh, the, the Holy Week. Lord, as Jamie reminded us, the gift that we have to be able to invite those to, to church where there's a, a feeling where people want to come back and they want to enjoy the, the riches of the church, but maybe they don't know where to go. We pray that we would be salt and light into the community, that we would find ways in which we can invite others, whether it's handing them an order of worship or one of these cards, but Maybe having a conversation or just reminding them of, of the joys it is to be in fellowship with other believers and, and what it means to be a saved person in, in a dark and fallen world. Lord, we pray that you would give us boldness, boldness, but Lord, we pray that you would also give us joy and zeal in it. Uh, Lord, we also think of the many members that make up this church. Lord, we're thankful for the ways in which you continue to bless them. Lord, we're thankful for David Chasdale's recent um, 
procedure and the, the unremarkable results from it and that uh, there's been no more events, but Lord, that's remarkable in itself. We're thankful for the, the skill of the doctors and the, the answered prayers. Lord, we continue to pray for others uh, in the church who are, who are dark nights of the soul. Lord, not just one night, but other nights that continue on. Lord, for the, the hardship of those that have lost loved ones, those that, that seem to be in a, in a spiral of, of darkness. Lord, we pray that you would shine light in, that you would be Allow them to be reminded of the truths. We pray that you would also be with us as a church. May we come alongside each other. May we, may we share each other's burdens as you have con- commanded us to do. Or may we do that joyfully. Lord, we also pray that you would be with those that are sick, those that are uh, physically ill. Lord, we pray that you would bring quick healing. Lord, we also think of the expectant mothers. We think of those through natural uh, the childbirth, but Lord, also those through adoption. Lord, we pray that you would bring quick resolve to any complications, any, any sidetrack uh, feelings. But Lord, we pray that you would continue to nourish our parents. Lord, that you would be protecting families, that you'd be protecting marriages. And Lord, as we, as we think of children, Lord, we think of oftentimes the, the hardship that comes with families. We pray that you would be with those that have loved ones, children, or, or parents, or, or brothers and sisters, or just uh, good friends that have walked away from the faith, or have, have seen uh, in, in their own lives and in the lives of others the good news of the gospel, but for some reason are resistant to it, or are in some way fighting against it. Lord, we pray that you would soften hearts, that you would allow gospel seeds to be cast and them to be watered. But Lord, we pray that you would do a mighty work, that you would allow uh, the individuals in this room uh, to, to joyfully be able to continue to pray and to see your hand at work. And Lord, as we think of gospel seeds and as we think of the watering, we're thankful for the word of God. We're thankful that you have given it to us and that you have given us men. Uh, particularly, we think of Pastor Jamie as he will come and he will proclaim the word to us. We pray that our hearts would be attentive, that our minds would be sharp. And Lord, that you would be glorified, that you would use his words to to change us, Lord, not just for change sake, but for your glory and for our good. And we pray that you would also be with us as we have the opportunity to give. Lord, we are such a blessed people. And Lord, as we take up our morning offering to you, Lord, may we be reminded of how blessed we are to be able to give to you. We pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Let's be reminded by God's word as we take up our morning offering from 2 Corinthians Chapter 9, verse 7. Each must give as he has decided in his own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver.
Heavenly Father, we know that you own the cattle on a thousand hills. Lord, we know that you own it all, Lord, that it's all yours. But Lord, you have given it to us. And so, Lord, as we have given to the church, Lord, we pray that you would allow this to be used for your kingdom, that it would grow it, and that you would use it in amazing ways. Lord, we thank you all for your continued provision for us and for this church. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. <laughs> Let me ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew 12. We're going to pick up in our sermon series in Matthew. Matthew 12, it'll help you to have this text open so you can see with your eyes what you hear with your hear, with your ears. A person is known by their fruit. The kind of fruit a person produces depends on the state of their heart. And the way a person's heart, according to Jesus, is known is by their words. Listen and hear these words. Either make the tree good and its fruits good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You rod of vipers, how can you speak good when you're evil? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. The evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, moments ago we just prayed it is by your grace. It is by your grace that we stand before you this morning. It is by your grace that we sing of your goodness to us this morning. It is by your grace that we get to open up your word. Father, texts like this can be a hard text. It can be a hard text to preach, and definitely a hard text to receive. But maybe by your grace, receive the words that are ever before us. And maybe by your grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit, be changed and transformed and renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit through your preached word. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. We are coming back to the Gospel of Matthew for a couple of weeks, and then we'll take a break to do Palm Sunday and, and Holy Week, and then we'll have Easter, and then we'll come back to the Gospel of Matthew, and hopefully that'll probably take us up to uh, the Reformation. Uh, we'll see. I mean, it feels like it's a long stretch, and, and it's sometimes in normal world it is, but in terms of Sundays, you have 52, and so it's not, you know, that, that many uh, in, in some ways. Uh, you may recall... Back January the 28th, we looked at the verses above our text, verses 22 through 32. Now, if you are joining with us, if you're a visitor today, it's not that we're that slow, and it's not that we took off a break, but church, you'll remember, we've had a busy few weeks. We had the month of, of February where we spent some time talking about missions and our focus on missions, and then we had Pastor Adam's installation service, and so we've had a lot of water, a lot of good water, but a lot of water under our bridge 
as it comes to the pulpit in our sermon series. And so now we're coming back to this text. And while as I was preparing to preach, I thought, you know, it might be good for me to re-preach that sermon. Because that sermon, that text, is very much connected with our text this morning. I'm not going to re-preach, and so go ahead and take a deep breath. I'm not going to re-preach that sermon, but I am going to tell you the three points, or, or kindly the three points of that sermon on January the 28th, as it will be a good setup for our text this morning. So there are three points. One is that there are two kingdoms, and these two kingdoms are divided. And there's a conflict. It's not a, a friendly conflict between these two kingdoms. There are serious conflicts. They, these two kingdoms are opposed to each other. These two uh, kingdoms have different priorities. Point two is Jesus gives a logical argument about these two kingdoms. You may recall, and if you don't recall, you can, or if you don't remember, if you weren't even here, you can look up at the text and, and read it uh, to kind of catch yourself up. But Jesus healed a demon-oppressed man who was blind, who was mute, and the Pharisees accused Jesus of casting out the demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. And then we also looked at, in this text, Jesus dealing with the unpardonable sin, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, or to speak against the Holy Spirit. So it's on the hills of that teaching, it's on the hills of, of what was going on there that Jesus makes it clear, fruit and tree belong together. Verse 33 says, either make. Now some of your translations may have the word consider. The word there is consider to be. So either consider the tree to be good, and its fruits good, or consider the tree to be bad. Some of your translations may have sickly, and its fruits bad, or its fruit sickly. For by the fruit, the tree is known. The more I read, the more I study, the more I realize there is no middle ground with the things of the Lord. Jesus does not give us the neutral zone here. There's good trees and good fruit. There's bad trees and bad fruit. There's no middle ground. There's no neutral. There, no, there is no uh, neutrality here. Uh, you may recall in, in verse 30, glance up with your eyes and look at verse 30. Jesus, whoever's not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Again, Jesus makes it clear to the hearers that day, and Matthew makes it clear to the readers today that there is no middle ground. You're either for Jesus or you're against Jesus. That's your only two options. For the people during the day of Jesus, they needed to consider the deeds of Jesus. Contrary to some, Jesus does not call us to blind faith in him. Jesus was saying to the, to the people during this day, consider the healings, right? Consider the, the demon-oppressed man. Consider the lame, how the lame walked, how the blind came to see, how the mute speak. Jesus was saying to the people that day to, that they needed to consider those fruits. Are those good fruits? Are those good things? think we would all say those are good deeds right what Jesus was doing was a good thing he was healing people he was giving people physically a better life the people who were according to Matthew with the demon oppressed man who was blind and mute who then was released from the uh, the demon oppression and as well as was able to speak and able to see Matthew says those who were there that day marveled they were amazed at the good work. And yet to call Jesus bad, to say that his good work, that his amazing where his marvelous works belongs to Beelzebub, the prince of demons, makes no sense. Who Jesus must be is determined by what Jesus does. A tree is judged by its fruit. And I get it. I get it, church. We're living in a time and space where people say you can't judge. 
Jesus is calling the people there that day to judge, to consider, to make a judgment call. And to make that judgment based on the fruits that they see. See, Jesus' implication was that the Pharisees was showing their true character by saying that these things were, that he was saying, by saying the things that they were saying about Jesus. Look at verse 34. He says, you broad, you offspring of vipers. Vipers is a species of poisonous snakes. This is a very pretty serious name calling by Jesus. Why and, and to whom is Jesus speaking to here? We know earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, John the Baptist uses this term in Matthew 3, 7, when he was explaining the actions of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We'll see this term again used in Matthew 23, 33, Jesus speaking to the seven woes of the, to the scribes and to the Pharisees. He says, you broad of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? It's pretty intense. Again, just to help remind us and to help give us the context here, Jesus is surrounded by a crowd who witnessed a demon-oppressed man who was blind and who and who was mute, now totally healed instantly. Some of the crowd responded with ama amazement, asking the question, is this man, is Jesus the son of David? Is Jesus the Messiah, the one that we've been waiting on? That's what some of the folks were asking because they're seeing the fruit of Jesus. The Pharisees who were there, who saw the same miracle take place, who did not deny the miracle happened, Instead of the response being of one of amazement toward Jesus, because they did not like Jesus, because they were jealous of Jesus, because Jesus had offended them, they tried to give credit to Satan. They were spewing lies. They were spewing vicious lies. The religious leaders of that day were spreading poison like a viper now I've only did just very little very minimum research here so if you know better then maybe tell me afterwards so my very limited research here is it takes and I get it, it all depends on the kind of, of, of snake that it is a kind of poisonous snake that it is but it only takes a very little amount of poison from a snake to be lethal to be deadly Jesus draws a conclusion from the previous verse. Since the Pharisees have shown themselves to be bad trees, producing evil fruit, it's almost like how dare they pretend to speak good things. The words coming out of their mouth was toxic, was lethal, was deadly. Even if it was only a small amount of toxic, deadly words coming out of their mouth. Four. Here is the connection. Those of you who remember School Rock, remember the function of the conjunction is to connect. So here Jesus is connecting for out of the abundance of the heart. The heart here is not the muscle that pumps our blood. The heart is the core of who we are. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, we may be able to put on airs at times. Certainly the Pharisees did. We may be able to think that we are better than others. We may think that we are, are uh, we may think highly of ourselves, that we are superior to others. Again, certainly, that was the Pharisees' uh, point of view. They thought that they were better in every way. But at some point, and this is true for us as well today too, church, at some point, our true identity shines forth. The Pharisees could not deny the work. They could not deny the miracle of Jesus. So instead, they spoke evil. They spoke lies. Their words revealed their heart. One commentator said this, The heart is the core of one's being, the home of core convictions. And if the heart overflows with content for Christ, words and deeds will follow. So let me ask you, church, do you have a contempt, a hatred for Christ? Now let me ask you the follow-up question. What does your words 
reflect. R.C. Sproul in verse, 20, uh, verse 35 says that Jesus continued to hammer away at the truth that what is inside of a man determines what comes out of the man. Jesus says the good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. The evil person out of his evil treasures bring forth evil. The NIV translators, I think, gives us a little bit understanding, a better grasp of this verse. If you have the NIV, it says this. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. Just as a good tree must produce good fruit, a good man, because he has good treasures in his heart, brings forth good things. Likewise, a bad tree brings bad fruit. An evil man having evil treasures in the heart brings forth evil. The Pharisees slandered Jesus because there was slander in their heart. The Pharisees were hostile toward Jesus because there was hostility in their heart. The Pharisees were jealous toward Jesus. Because there was jealousy in their heart. So let me ask you this, church. Let me make a few observations. Just think about this past week of your own life. Maybe even just think about this morning, if you would like. Think about your words. Think about your interactions. If someone was to hear your words, would they hear words of jealousy? Well, there's jealousy in your heart. If someone was to hear your words, would they hear manipulative words? Well, there's manipulation in your heart. Did you use controlling words? Well, there's control in your heart. Would someone hear the words of, of greed from you? You have a greedy heart. Someone hear lying words from you. You have a lying heart. See, Jesus is saying, what we say with our lips, that is what is in our heart. That is who we are at our core. But there is hope, isn't there, church? And we praise the Lord that there is hope. The psalmist in Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God. And know my heart. Know who I am at my core. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. The psalmist is calling out to God to know who he is. And then he doesn't leave it there, does he? He says, lead me in the way of everlasting. Lead me to repentance. The psalmist understood his indwelling sin and his tendency to produce evil at his core he wanted to be God honoring what about you church who are you at your core none of us are perfect we all struggle but do you desire at your core to be God honoring I don't know your struggles you don't know my struggles but let me say this the struggling is good we should only be concerned when we stop struggling because that means we have given totally into our sinful selves. So keep struggling. So if a moment ago when I gave you some examples of maybe some words that might be on your lips this past week, again, I'm not speaking that I know anything about you. So you don't have to come up and tell me someone must have told you something about me. They didn't. I'll go and tell you that. But if that was you, like if you struggle with jealousy or if you struggle with manipulation or if you struggle with being controlling or greedy or lying or whatever it may be, whatever your talk may be, keep the struggle. Keep struggling. Keep striving to put that sin to death. Keep striving to honor God with your lips. Verse 36, Jesus, I tell you that we know all Scripture is important. From Genesis to Revelation, God's word is important. The Westminster Divines in chapter 1 of Westminster Confession says that all scripture is most necessary. We also know 
that every word and every deed of Jesus was not recorded for us. As John says in the Gospel of John at the end, his very last uh, uh, verse in the Gospel of John says, and there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. There are times, and we talked about this actually in uh, a Sunday school this morning w- with Jonah. There are times where there's kind of cliffhangers. We, we don't know the response. There are times in the Gospel of Matthew when, Ma- when, when Matthew would write for his readers where it would be kind of an open-ended, kind of you don't know the exact answer, you don't know really what's going on. And the ideal is that the reader would consider how would I respond if I was in that situation. And then there are times, again, the Gospel writers do this greatly, there are times where they will use words and, and indicators that as the reader, we should perk up and pay more attention to. We should give our attention to it even more than what we ordinarily would be doing, and it is to remind us something big is happening. The phrase, I tell you, is one of those occasions. We need to perk up. We need to pay close attention because Jesus is focusing on the topic at hand. He says, I tell you, on that day of judgment, that should make us perk up. I want to give us two reasons why that should make us perk up. One is it is clear in all of Scripture, and it's clear here, that there will be a day of judgment. Jesus makes it clear that there will be a day of judgment. The Westminster Divines, the the confession we read, the larger catechism question, makes it clear that there will be a day of judgment. The Apostles' Creed, that we say every Lord's Day, we believe the third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. So on that day of judgment, There will be no more excuses. There will be no more getting away with it. God's justice will be served. The second reason that we should perk up here is even believers will have to stand and give an account for how we lived our lives here on earth. Every one of us must stand to give an account for our words and deeds. Now I understand that we are justified by grace alone and faith alone in Christ alone, but that does not mean those who are justified that you get to live your life here on earth however you so well desire with no consequences. Jesus says, I tell you, on that day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. Some of your translations may have empty word, idle word, useless word, not giving careful consideration kind of words that you speak. For by your words, you will be justified. It's a legal term. It's a judicial term. To be justified, to, to be declared not guilty, to be acquitted. And by your words, you will be condemned. Again, that's a judicial word, to be judged guilty. Now, before you go making justifications in your head and your heart right now, think about those words. Think about the gravity of what Jesus is saying, church. Words matter. All of our words matter. Even our careless, idle, empty words matter matter our words that we say without thinking matters and again church Christian there is hope right our hope at the throne of almighty God is to plead the name of Jesus our only plea before the throne of the almighty is mercy our words your words are hurt. Even those secret words, 
Those words that you think only certain people hear, your words are heard before the throne of Almighty God, and you will be held accountable by your words. Think about that for a moment. The gravity of that for a moment. When I was growing up, there's an old saying, and it's not a hillbilly saying either, because I've heard it since I've moved away from, from my home, and so I know you've probably heard this as well. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Or the other saying that we would say all the time is, I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say bounces off of me and sticks to you. I mean, those are cute little phrases, and I understand, uh, the, I understand the sentiments of those words, but church, words damage the image bearer of Almighty God. Words do hurt. Some of you have been damaged by the words of a loved one. And when you've been damaged by those words, how many times has it come back then? Oh, I just really wasn't thinking about my word. Right? Those careless words. Some of you have been damaged by the words of a pastor who you thought loved you, who you thought cared for you. But church, the flip of that is true as well. Some of you have damaged loved ones by your words. Even when you say, well, I didn't really mean it that way. Some of you have damaged pastors by your words. Now, I'm not promoting snowflakes here. Jesus is not promoting snowflakes either. But the point is, our words matter. We can either encourage with our words, be truthful with our words, build up with our words, or we can be discouraging with our words. We can be untruthful with our words. We can tear down with our words. And why are our words important? What do our words reveal? Our heart. Our words reveal who we are at our core. I understand that there's a false theology, a false reasoning about man out there. And this popular ideal is that man is basically good. Let me go ahead and dispel that false theology. Man is not basically good. Man at our core, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, based off the work of Jesus Christ, apart from that miracle, man at our core is evil. Paul says this in Romans 3.10, There is none righteous, no, not one. Our words reveal our hearts. Have you ever met someone for the very first time and you said, Wow, they must have a really good heart. And the way you justified that was because of the way in which they spoke, the words they used. Conversely, the the flip side of that can be true as well. Like you judge someone, you say, wow, like they really have an evil heart. And you base that off of the words they used. Our words reflect the true essence of who we are. According to Jesus, we'll provide irrefutable evidence on Judgment Day. The Pharisees' heart was clearly revealed because of the evil words they spoke against Jesus and his work. So what about you, church? What about you? What do do your words reveal about Jesus? One commentator said this, this is Jesus' diagnosis for our soul. So what's the conclusion of the matter before us this morning? I get it. I pray for my children often. I pray for covenant children often. Because I can remember a time in my lifetime when words mattered. When words mattered. And we be held accountable for our words. I understand, church, we are now living in a time where it seems like words do not matter. Where it seems like somebody can, be, can bold-face lie... And when confronted by that lie, they can deny it, they can say they didn't say it, or they can just say, well, you just misheard me, even though it's recorded and we can replay it, and it's like, no, here are the words, right? Well, no, no, you just missed it. You just don't understand. 
Church, words reveal your character. Words reveal the core of your being. This week, just try something this week. Be mindful of your words as you interact with your loved ones, as you interact with your boss or with your classmates or with your students or with your whoever it is, your co-workers, I don't know if I said that or not, but whoever it is that you interact with, be mindful of your words that you use and ask yourself, what does your words reveal about you? Pray the words of the psalmist. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Pray those words. Just ask yourself. I, my public confession here, I, my family didn't know I was preaching here, didn't know I was going to say. This past week, I was mindful of my words a few times. And I get, it's hard. And it's not, I, mean, I have a great family. They love me well. But it's hard. And then when you start thinking about your words, it's like, wow, well, what am I saying about the, to an image bearer of Almighty God? So think about your words. If you're here this morning and you are a confessing unbeliever, Paul says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, what's Paul saying? If you use your words, if you use your words, say that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, One believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. Church, one of the biggest ways that we are made different from all other creation that God created. We're made in the image of Almighty God, and He's given us words. He's given us the gift of words. With our mouth, we bless. With our mouth, we curse. So I ask you, Christian, What does your words reflect about your character, about who you are? Yet if you're here as a professing unbeliever, we're grateful and thankful you're here. I encourage you because I love you. It's a great warning. Repent. Believe in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, you are a good God and you care for us. You provide for us. You love us. You take care of us. My guess is, Lord, some of us was not expecting to come and be confronted this morning. And yet, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we've been confronted with our words. May we, by your grace and by your mercy and for your glory, repent. May we believe in the complete and finished work of Christ on the cross. May we, as believers, have an understanding that we are not earning our right before your throne, that Christ has earned our right to come to your almighty throne. And yet, because of that, we are called to a higher state of living, to a higher standard of living for your glory. May our words reflect your goodness, your love. May our words reflect your grace in us as we interact with those that you bring into our path. May we be reminded of that, that the people we interact with is because you've brought them into our path. May we be God-honoring with our words, wherever that may be, whoever that may be. And we pray that if there is someone that doesn't know you in our midst, be it here in the sanctuary, be it online, may today be the day of salvation. May they repent, may they believe. For it's in your great name we pray, Jesus. Amen.
Amen. Just one reminder, we have evening worship at 5.30. Pastor Adam is continuing our story through Joseph. I'd encourage you to come back for you to worship. We'll also be celebrating the Lord's table. So the Lord invites you to come, send under his preached word, and to come to his table this evening at 5.30. Now, Christian, look up. Receive the Lord's benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. May you go in peace. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. And all God's people said...